Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Praise his holy name. I come this morning with much heaviness in my heart as we have dealt with the issues of this past week. But we come to talk about also widening the welcome and embracing our call to racial justice. As was read, Matthew 13, 31, 32, he told another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet it grows. It is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch on its branches. I'd like to talk with you briefly this morning about seeds that have been sown. Every morning for the past few weeks, uh, I rise to the sound of birds, mostly robins, perched on a branch singing outside my window. The sound is familiar and it's comforting. It seems that no matter where I live, they return and they find a sturdy branch. It seems that I can imagine myself as that bird on that sturdy branch, greeting the day. And I wonder, what would I say? I suspect I would sing a song of joy, a song of love, a song of hope, a song of anticipation, strife, and triumph. Then I might just think of the sturdy branch I was standing on. There are many things I may never know. I may never understand about the bombings and the life lost or fire that really devastates a town and many, more, many other things in the universe. So I keep right now my inquisitive and open mind and heart, and I stand on the things that I do know. I know my hope, my faith, and my understanding, and that I stand on the shoulders of sturdy people who have gone before me, on the shoulders of my ancestors who chose to live through the wretchedness of the Middle Passage when dying might have been easier, the enslaved on the Savage and the all Britain family farm and plantation who worked from sunup to sunset. They could have chosen to not live, but they had a faith, they had a hope. They believed that one day some little girl would be born by the name of Monique, and she would be free. And she would be able to stand before you and say that there is hope. I know there is hope because I know people who hoped. They hoped so much and so strongly and so deeply that someone could stand on their shoulders. I stand there. When there are people who stood beside those who were suffering, of my ancestors, those who were enslaved, those who lived through Jim Crow, they were allies. They were people who gave water to the dying and thirsty on enslaved ships through the Middle Passage. They were sowing seeds of humanity or allies who risk exclusion when secretly teaching people like W.E.B. Du Bois to read and write, or Native American people 
who sheltered my people when they escaped tyranny. I stand on the shoulders of ordinary people whose stories may never be known outside of family and community. I stand on the shoulders of people who walked across the Pettus Bridge from Selma to Montgomery. You don't see them in the pictures. You don't readily recognize them. I do, because we all kind of look alike in the Savage family. So I can point them out and say, let's find out who that person is. And sure enough, it's a Savage. They came and they stood perhaps in the middle and perhaps in the back. But they were there. They came because they lived in Montgomery. They lived in Snow Hill. They lived in Camden for generations. So I can trace them back to about the 1780s. They had been there because they knew they owed a debt to those who had paved the way for them, who had been there all those years. They had to stand up. They had to speak up. They had to be present. In my family, we were taught from an early age by, my fam by what my family called precept and example, that we had to both show up and stand up. Some of you have been in work our workshops and you have heard me say that I grew up in a small rural town on Lake Michigan. I was most often, if not always, the only black girl in my classroom. I never remember there being any more than two of us at the most. You know, it, it wasn't unusual, especially in elementary school, for little white boys to pull my pigtail and call me the N-word. Often I would just beat them up and leave it at that. <laughs> but if my mother found out that I beat them up, and my brother usually always told, she would be upset and she'd be disappointed in me. And she would explain to me that violence was not the answer. And this was long before the nonviolent movement of the 60s and 70s and certainly before the WWJD bracelets, we lived way out in the country and we had no car and we had no phone. So when these things would happen, my mother would walk the two miles into town the next day and talk to the principal and the teacher and tell them what her expectations were and what her timeline was. That was important because I began to learn what you could do. If you couldn't fight, you could talk. If you couldn't fight, you could walk. But you had to do something. We lived in the country and she walked to town. And then in the evening, we would walk over to the perpetrator's house. And my mother would talk to his parents. And I would just stand there. Almost always on the walk to the boy's house, we would talk. We would talk about what she believed life was made of, what we were called here to be, who we were in Christ's eyes, how we stood and how we should stand. I was always filled with pride when we got to the house and my mother talked to the family. On our way home, I would just be thinking, mainly about how happy I was that Jimmy, Johnny, or Billy had gotten in trouble, but also about, what, about how proud I was of the way this woman walked. Not just the way she walked, because that was awesome in and of itself. You could tell Johnetta was in the house by the sound of her walk. It was firm, it was definite, and she was going in a direction. She came to the school so often that the kids in my class would go, oh, Monique's mother's in the building. <laughs> they had to face my mother. 
And that was important to me because someone spoke up, someone stood up, someone walked two miles because they believed that I had a right to live in peace. And then the first week of my third grade year, my teacher told a story, what I understood as an adult, a very racist story, about her summer vacation in New Orleans. I never spoke again in that class unless I was asked a direct question. My mother had to go to school several times because of my odd behavior. At first, as long as I wasn't being disobedient to the teacher and that I was answering the questions asked me, she didn't worry about it. But as the months dragged on, she saw a, hap she saw a child go through uh, what we now know is a depression. Over Christmas break, I changed back to that child that she knew, kind of happy and as talkative as I ever was. She took me to church and she had people pray for me. And the community of churchgoers told me that they stood behind me, that whatever was going on, that they stood behind me. Finally, she was able to walk me back through the months and I was able to uh, somehow reconstruct the story that I hadn't connected to my silence. I didn't know how I had lost my voice. I didn't know why I had lost my voice. I just knew that it seemed to be nothing in that space for me. And I just had to occupy it. When finally we reconstructed the story together, my mother was inflamed. As soon as the weather broke, school started, and she could get in the road, she was in her road, in the road, on her way back to school. This time I wasn't so happy because I didn't want the teacher to get in trouble. I really didn't. I felt embarrassed and ashamed. And excuse me. And so my mother took me into the principal's office with her. And she, we sat there. We had to sit there for what seemed to me to be a long time. She reached over and she held my hand and she said, Monique, do you remember the Sunday school lesson? And I was going, oh no, <laughs> this is a quiz. You know the one about the faith of a mustard seed? And if you had that, you could move a mountain. I only remembered it because our Sunday school teacher had brought a package of mustard seeds with her and to show us how tiny they were. And one of the guys in my Sunday school class had poured them on the floor and it caused a big ruckus and he got expelled from Sunday school. I didn't say all these stories were good. <laughs> I nodded and I said, yes, ma'am, I remember. She handed me a little bead and said quite firmly, we're going to move this mountain. Boy, that felt better. I don't know why. But she had said it with such strong conviction that with the faith of this little mustard seed, not the whole plant, and not the whole bush, but the faith of just the seed. We were going to move a mountain. I believed her. We finally got into the principal's office, and my mother reported the experience I had had in my class. The principal called in some girls from my class, friends of mine, and they had no memory. Who would remember what a teacher said at the beginning of the school year about their boring vacation? It didn't impact them. They had no memory of it. And so the teacher just sort of said something like, 
you and your daughter are just a little bit too sensitive about race. In a flash, I saw go across my mother's face that feeling I used to have when I beat people up. And then she gathered herself back together, took me by the hand, and we started the walk home. She didn't dismiss it. She couldn't let it go. We understand that the principal never even talked to the teacher. And then my mother brought the, this conversation and this issue up to our congregation, this little country church. And again, the saints stood and prayed. But there was more than prayer. The pastor then went to the local ministerial association and told them the story. And it is my understanding that at the next board meeting, there were all of the people from my church, my pastor, pastors from other churches in the county, and their congregants. I don't know exactly what happened to that teacher. We moved. I went to a different school. There was never any big mass kind of movement. But there was a group of people who saw injustice and band together and stood up, critical in the life of one little third grade girl. That's the community on whose shoulders I stand. Long before there was a civil rights movement, a few black people and a few black, white people went to a school board meeting and said, we stand on the side of justice. I did regain my academic and social voice. Lots of things happened to me from the third to the fifth grade that were fundamental in my understanding of fighting for racial justice. Here I stand, still talking, still standing up. I learned some valuable lessons from this experience. One, that I must speak to the mountain. Because if I don't speak to the mountain, how does the mountain even know that it has to move? Speaking truth to power is sometimes intimidating, but absolutely necessary. I learned that it takes a village. Sometimes it takes individual courage, but often it takes all of us together to stand up you know, sometimes we say, for God I live, for God I die. Sometimes we stand up for justice. And whether I live or I die, I don't care at that moment. What I care about is that I stand, speak a truth, so that I can be a part of moving a mountain. Owning my own voice is critical to my soul, and to my development. When we find someone who has been silenced, we must speak up. I stand, we stand, on the shoulders of extraordinary and ordinary people who showed up, helped shoulder burdens for those who couldn't. In the parable about the various people uh, who might sow seeds in different places. Jesus said in, thir in Matthew 13, 8, still another seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, 160, 30 times what it was sown. Sowing seeds is important. We sow them, sometimes whether we know it or not. We need to be conscious of on what ground we're sowing. I am encouraged, and I encourage you, to plant seeds of justice and peace, love and hope 
understanding. And as Martin Luther King said, when he quoted from the prophet Amos, until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty river. Blessed be the word of the Lord. Amen.